So I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a history lesson uh, in an attempt to, to tell you a story about how surveillance has evolved and how law enforcement and intelligence agencies are addressing and coping with changes in technology. For more than 100 years, the telephone companies have provided assistance to law enforcement agents who wanted to monitor the telephone calls of, of, of targets in criminal investigations. For 100 years, these companies have provided this assistance. In many cases, there have been dedicated teams of, of employees at the companies. Today, hundreds of employees at each company are there responding 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to requests from federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies. Really, for a telephone company at this point, surveillance is part of the business. It's not a business they intended to go into, but it's a business they are now in whether they like it or not. And so for 100 years, law enforcement agencies have known that they could turn to these trusted parties, these partners, the AT&Ts and Verizons of the world, who would give them what they want, and then eventually would even build surveillance features into the very core parts of their network. Our phones today are designed, first and foremost, to be surveilled. They're designed to deliver calls and text messages as almost an afterthought, but the first feature is the surveillance feature. Uh, and so what I want to talk to you about today is sort of how governments have responded to changes in technology, and in particular, how they've responded to first the possibility that people would protect their communications, and then ultimately the availability and use of technologies that would protect people's communications. This is Louis Free. Louis Free was the director of the FBI in the 1990s, and Free was really the first FBI official and first US government official to raise the threat of encryption technology to the public debate. Uh, the language that Free used was really um, a big deal at the time. This is in the, in the mid-1990s when technology that would allow regular people to protect their communications from surveillance was, was controlled by law. It was controlled as a, music, as a munition, as an arms, as arms technology, and thus not available for export outside the United States. I'm going to read you some of his quotes. Uncrackable encryption will allow drug lords, spies, terrorists, and even violent gangs to communicate about their crimes and their conspiracies with impunity. This is this doomsday scenario that Free was describing of a world in which encryption was available to the masses. He added, the only acceptable answer is socially responsible encryption uh, that permits timely law enforcement and national security access and decryption pursuant to a court order. What Free was talking about was something that technologists and, uh, and those of us in this space call key escrow. The idea was that a copy of your encryption key, a copy of your encryption password, would be stored by some third party. And if you, decide, if you did something bad and, or the government decided to take an interest in you, they could go to that third party and get the key and then decipher all your communications. This was the socially responsible cryptography that Free was calling for in 1996. And this is actually the chip that implemented this technology. It was called the Clipper chip. And the idea was that there would be one of these chips in every telephone in the country, and all of our communications would be encrypted, which was a good thing, but the encryption could be broken by the government whenever they needed to uh, in case that someone did something bad. Uh, so the Clipper was not a success in the market. It turned out that people didn't want this technology, particularly once researchers showed that the encryption was broken and couldn't just be broken by the government, but could be broken by anyone else. Uh, and so towards the end of the 1990s, this system of controls over technology came down. The wall, the wall fell down, uh, and suddenly people could export this encryption technology. Suddenly anyone in the world could download free software or buy commercial software that could protect their emails, that could protect their messages, and allow them to communicate in a way that governments could not read or decipher their communications. But PGP, which is one of those tools, uh, it, it was never a problem for the FBI. It was never a problem for law enforcement. And the reason was is that the encryption tools that were available looked something like this. And in fact, they haven't really changed uh, in their design since then. It turns out that the encryption tools that were available in the 1990s, the encryption tools that the government said everyone could use, were so difficult to use 
were so difficult to use correctly that no one ever used them. Uh, how many people in this audience have sent an encrypted email in the last week? All right, and this is a pretty paranoid audience. This is, these are people who are willing to show up uh, on a Wednesday night to come and see me talk. These tools have, 20 years later, they are still not used by regular people. And it's not because of legal issues. It's because they're a pain in the butt to use. All right, and so although these doomsday scenarios were portrayed by top FBI and other law enforcement officials, the doomsday they predicted didn't come about. Not because of the law, but because the technology was difficult to use. You could encrypt, but realistically you wouldn't. Uh, and so that brings us to where we are now. Brings us to where we are now, where encryption technology not only is becoming easier to use, but is, that it is now increasingly being built into the products that we all use. So this is uh, the current FBI director, Jim Comey. This is him speaking at uh, a cryptography event at, in Washington, D.C. Uh, just a few months ago, you can see Comey Crypto, which was the hashtag uh, behind his head. And I'm going to read you a quote of his. Encryption threatens to lead all of us to a very dark place. Sophisticated criminals will come to count on these means of evading detection. It's the equivalent of a closet that cannot be opened, a safe that cannot be cracked. And is that an applause for him? I don't know what that was. Um, <laughs> So the rhetoric really hasn't changed in 20 years. The rhetoric is the same. They're still predicting doomsday scenarios, but what's changed is that people are actually using encryption now. Um, so of course, this is Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. Uh, Apple has been very bold in its marketing in the last year or two. This is from Apple's uh, privacy section of their website. Your iMessages and FaceTime calls are your business, not ours. Your communications are protected by end-to-end -end encryption across all your devices when you use iMessage and FaceTime. And we wouldn't be able to comply with a wiretap order even if we wanted to. So what this means is that right now, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, and you send text messages or you make a video or audio call with their products to someone else who also has an iPad or an iPhone, those messages are encrypted. And they're encrypted in such a way that if you listen to what Apple says and you believe what Apple says, which I think reasonable people can, can ask questions about, um, they're not able to monitor and thus the government is not able to easily monitor. Now that's a really big change. That's a sea change uh, from where we were just a few years ago when if you were making a call with your AT&T or Verizon phone, those companies could and would hand over your telephone communications. They could and would record copies of your text messages and hand them over to government agents at a later date. What's fascinating about what Apple has done isn't that they have made encryption available to users, but that they have turned it on by default. And so even if you don't think about it, you're now using and gaining the protections of this encryption technology. Apple isn't the only player. Uh, I don't know how many of you in this room use WhatsApp, but this is an extremely popular service, particularly uh, in the global south and many, many non-US countries. It is basically the de facto text messaging service. Uh, and WhatsApp now also uses extremely strong encryption technology, some of the best that's out there. Uh, this is the, uh, the founder of WhatsApp, Jan Combe, saying, quote, I grew up in a society where everything you did was eavesdropped on, recorded, snitched on. Nobody should have the right to eavesdrop or you become a totalitarian state, the kind of state I escaped as a kid to come to this country. Pretty bold statement from a tech company CEO. Uh, and again, this is a company whose product is used by hundreds of millions of people. People who are downloading it not because it's an encryption app. People who are downloading it because it's easy, it's free, it's the app their friends are already using. And this is a company who, in November of last year, turned on extremely strong encryption technology that makes the old-fashioned wiretaps difficult, if not impossible. Now, if you don't trust Apple, and you don't trust WhatsApp, which is now owned by Facebook, and you have the ability to convince your friends and loved ones and colleagues to download other software, there's a tool that I really like that's called Signal. It's available in the App Store, and a version of it is also available for Android phones. And using this app, you can make free encrypted telephone calls and send encrypted text messages. It doesn't cost you any money. Uh, and this is made by a team 
of widely respected researchers. There are no hidden back doors in the service. The problem is your friends and loved ones are probably not using it already, so you have to sort of convince them to download this, whereas with iMessage or, or WhatsApp, probably people are already using it. Uh, and so it's the availability of services like this. It's the fact that suddenly hundreds of millions of people now have access to encryption technology and are now using encryption technology that is causing a epic freakout in law enforcement and national security circles. So I'm speaking in Seattle, Microsoft hometown employer, going to get asked, so what's the deal with Microsoft's technology, right? We know that uh, Apple and WhatsApp, which is Facebook, are doing this. What about Microsoft? So Microsoft bought Skype. I assume everyone in the audience knows that Skype is a Microsoft service. Uh, according to an article that Glenn Greenwald published in 2013, um, Microsoft has, uh, has modified their services to make them more amenable to wiretapping by the US government. Quote, Skype was served with a directive to comply by the Attorney General, uh, and after they received that, that order, they, decide, they, they made modifications to the service that allowed the NSA to be able to monitor people's uh, Skype text messages and also Skype audio and video calls. Uh, this is Brad Smith, who is Microsoft's general counsel, fairly outspoken guy, has uh, criticized the actions of the US government in forcing Microsoft to hand over data on its Dublin-based servers, Dublin, Ireland-based servers to the US government. This is him in an interview last year. We assume that all calls, whether over the internet or by fixed line or mobile phone, will offer similar, similar levels of privacy and security. So that's Brad Smith saying that the degree of security that Microsoft intends to deliver to customers is the same that you get from your cell phone, which isn't very much. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're deeply concerned about privacy, if you don't want uh, the state to be able to wiretap your communications, uh, I'm afraid that I can't really recommend Skype, but there are plenty of other tools that you can use that will make surveillance much more difficult. All right, so these tools are on your phone today. If you have an iPhone, if you have an Android phone, you can download either WhatsApp or you can download Signal or you can download other services. These tools are available today. How are government agencies going to respond? Right? They're not going to just pack up their luggage and go home. They, they want to be able to wiretap the communications of interesting individuals, individuals who they believe are doing things that are bad. How will they respond? So in uh, 2012, I started researching the question of hacking by governments. There have been a number of stories uh, showing that, um, that governments around the world were buying off-the-shelf hacking software, that governments in Ethiopia and uh, Vietnam and other places were buying commercial surveillance technology that they could use to hack into people's computers and take over their webcams and microphones and that kind of thing. And I thought, well, hang on, the FBI has a lot of money. They're probably doing it too, right? So I stumbled on this document that uh, another civil liberties group, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, had been able to, to, to get from the government through FOIA. And as you can see, most of it's redacted, but there was this one line on the document, this remote operations unit that I saw, and I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Um, and so I started Google stalking the remote operations unit at the FBI to see what I could find out, and I... Uh, I looked at the LinkedIn pages of contractors who'd worked there. Uh, I found that the unit chief of the ROU uh, in his university fraternity alumni magazine described what he did at his day job. Um, <laughs> and so I was eventually able to take all this information and give it to the Wall Street Journal, and they were able to confirm that the FBI has a dedicated team of agents in Quantico, Virginia, and all they do every day is hack into people's computers. Uh, they have the ability to activate microphones and webcams. The most fascinating thing is the, the light next to your webcam isn't controlled by hardware. So they can turn the, micro, the, the, the uh, camera on without the light also going on. Uh, the light is sort of for your, for your benefit, but not if the FBI is in your computer. Um, and so this team has existed, it turns out, in one form or another since 2002. Uh, the first court order, the first application for a court order seeking permission to use this capability was not made public till 2007. And it wasn't until last year uh, that the FBI finally started to be at least a little bit 
open about their use of this technology. They, they went to this obscure body in Washington, D.C., a body run by the courts, and they said, we have this problem that right now we need to go to a judge in the district where the crime is happening to get a court order, and if we don't know where the bad guy is, we don't know which judge to go to. So we want permission to get a judge in any part of the country to authorize hacking in any other part of the country. So that was our opportunity, the first time ever for anyone in the civil liberties community to say, hang on a second, maybe we should have a conversation about hacking before we give the FBI these powers. And so I, in preparation for that hearing, I started reading everything that I could about hacking by law enforcement. And I read thousands of pages of documents, and it was in doing that that I read, uh, I, read I came across this file showing that the FBI had impersonated the Associated Press in 2007. Totally crazy, totally nuts that they would impersonate a reporter. Uh, and when it came to light, when I revealed this, the FBI did, not only didn't deny it, they defended the practice and said they thought it was perfectly appropriate. So the problem is they have this surveillance software. They need to get it onto your computer somehow. They have to trick you into downloading it or hack into your browser or, or something. And so it turns out that trickery is a pretty common method that they use. Um, so th that was the, the big news last November. It's, it's odd for me to come here to Seattle where this, you know, in, in the region where this thing actually happened. Uh, and again, this wasn't like the biggest terrorism threat in the world. This was a student calling in a bomb threat because he or she didn't want to take their exam on time. Um, this is a really powerful surveillance tool being used in that case. So uh, the FBI has a lot of money, and when agencies have lots of money, they buy really powerful tools. But not, not all agencies have the same resources and the same tools. And so what we find is that other law enforcement agencies that have the same needs but don't have the same budgets have to get lesser quality cut price tools. And luckily there is a thriving industry of commercial surveillance companies who are quite happy to sell sophisticated surveillance technology to law enforcement agencies around the world. So one of these companies is called Hacking Team. Their product is called DaVinci. Um, this is from their, some of their marketing materials. Defeat encryption, total control over your targets, thousands of encrypted communications per day, get them. I mean, the marketing is not shy. Um, they say that they can get encrypted voice, location, web browsing, the works. So I've been tracking this company for several years. Their software has shown up on the computers of activists and reporters in Morocco, in Ethiopia, in Vietnam, I mean, in use by some governments that really have no respect for human rights. Uh, this company doesn't care about who they sell to. Um, and so I've seen that for the last few years, they've been coming to Washington, D.C., and have been speaking at and exhibiting at this surveillance industry trade show uh, where law enforcement agencies show up and see like, what the cool tools are that year. Uh, and I, I actually went to this conference, I snuck in in 2012, uh, and I put on a, a suit. In, I don't know how many of you have been to Washington, D.C., but the uniform in, in Washington, D.C. is ugly, ill-fitting suits. Uh, and so I, I bought this like, cheap suit from the thrift store, and I put it on, and I went to the conference, and I snuck in, uh, and I secretly recorded what I saw. Um, and this company was there, and they were giving out their flyers and the mints and the fridge magnets. Uh, and, and so I learned about them there. It turns out they don't just go to that conference. They actually go to the Association of Law Enforcement Intelligence Units annual conference. This is uh, larger police departments have dedicated teams that just do surveillance. And this is the annual US conference for these law enforcement agencies surveillance teams. Uh, not only does hacking team go to the conference, um, not only do they speak at the conference, this is from the program in 2013, but they actually pay for the coffee break uh, at the conference. Um, so I've been hunting down Hacking Team for a while, because I'm convinced that they've sold their stuff in the United States. Um, they have uh, an, an office in Washington, D.C., uh, and I think it's only a matter of time uh, before their stuff is used by state and local agencies. So the problem with this technology, uh, and not just the hacking software, but in fact many kinds of surveillance technology, is that it's expensive. I mean, not like millions and millions of dollars, but like $200,000, $300,000. That's too much money for a local law enforcement agency. They have stretched budgets, particularly uh, you know, in these current economic times. They don't have the money for these cool toys, or cool tools, rather. 
Uh, and so luckily, there are nice bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. who are happy to give grant money to local law enforcement agencies. And so where you've seen surveillance technologies spreading into your community, here in, the, in Washington State, in Tacoma, where they purchased Stingray technology, it was with grants from DHS. So you guys got a, uh, a mesh network web camera thing here in Seattle, money from Washington, D.C. Uh, if there have been you know, surveillance cameras in your streets, money from Washington, D.C. Where it's been drones or armored personnel carriers, money from Washington, D.C. Uh, Bearcats, the armored personnel carriers that I think many people saw uh, in the wake of Ferguson. Money from DHS, money from DOJ, and surplus from DOD. Drones making their way into small town communities. Money from Washington, D.C. And this thing, the tool that I've been hunting for four years, the Stingray, uh, this is a tool that allows law enforcement agents to track and identify every cell phone in an area, money from Washington, D.C. So what's fascinating about the Stingray, and I guess similarly to the hacking stuff and the drones and these other things, these were tools that were designed for the military and for the intelligence community. And the problem is, is that the, the Raytheons and the Booz Allens and the Boeings that sell this technology, they can only sell so much to the military. Eventually, they've saturated that market. And so they're looking for additional markets. And while law enforcement is a happy market, these tools make law enforcement's job easier. So the tools sell themselves. The only question is, well, how do we pay for them? And that's where Washington, D.C. comes in. They write blank checks to pay for the gear. So, you know, I think reasonable people can have a debate about whether these technologies are appropriate in Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen, and I'm sure that my views maybe aren't in line with everyone's, but I think many of us should be able to agree that technologies that are designed for use in a hostile war zone may not necessarily be appropriate for Main Street back here in the United States. Uh, and the Stingray is an example of this. This is a technology that sends signals into people's living rooms, this is not a surgical technology that tracks one phone. This is a technology that sends signals into every house in a neighborhood, identifies every phone that's nearby, creates a list of every phone that's nearby, and then provides that to the agent that's using the device. This is a technology that was built for the, for the intelligence services. Just this week, the Wall Street Journal had a story talking about the relationship between the CIA and the marshals. The marshals put these things on airplanes and fly them over cities. And it described the relationship between the CIA technology unit and the Marshall's technology unit as a, as a marriage. That's how close uh, they are. Uh, presumably a happy marriage, not uh, an unhappy one. Uh, but this is a technology that is now trickling down to state and local law enforcement agencies around the country. And we know that they're in use here in Washington state. These are technologies that have been put into use in your community without any debate. Because the money came from Washington, they didn't have to go to the city council and have a thorough debate about how these technologies were going to be used. They didn't have to explain how they would work. They wouldn't have to explain the collateral damage or the fact that they would collect information about innocent people who've done nothing wrong. They go to the city council and they say, hey, we got this grant from FEMA or from DOJ. Can we accept the money? You know, this will help, this will help law enforcement. This will keep us safe. And of course, the city councils always say yes, because who's going to turn down free money, free training, free tools? So these tools are put into our communities without any oversight from our city councils, from our state legislative bodies, or even, even in Congress. There have been no hearings at the federal level, and there have only been hearings on stingrays in the last year in Michigan and Texas and, and uh, here in Washington state. Uh, these are technologies that are put into use in communities without, without any debate, and it's not, it's not like that's an oversight, that's the purpose. The argument that law enforcement agents use is that they have to put this technology into use secretly, because if they told the public how it, how it worked, it would tip off the bad guys. We see these quotes time and time again from local police chiefs saying, Look, you know, we're using this in the right way, we're using it in an appropriate way, but we can't tell you anything more, you have to trust us. Because if we told people how it worked, the bad guys would figure out how to avoid it. Right? And that's this conflict in the area of surveillance. They don't want to tell us how it works because someone in this room is going to commit a crime, so the rest of us have to be kept in the dark so that one person doesn't know how it works. So, and then in addition to not having any debate, 
means we also don't have any oversight. Legislative bodies don't know, and more importantly, the courts don't know. So here uh, in, in Washington State, the courts have been kept in the dark. Around the country, courts have been kept in the dark. To the extent that law enforcement agencies get orders, get court orders for this, the applications for the court orders don't say what they're planning on doing. And so, for example, in 2007, when the FBI hacked into that teenager's computer in Timberline, they didn't say what they were planning on doing. They didn't say in the application for the court order, by the way, we're going to impersonate the Associated Press. They didn't say we're going to hack into the computer. They said, we have some software that will identify this person's location. Can we use it? And the judge didn't get to decide, you know, is this an appropriate use of technology? Are these circumstances and is the method by which they'll use this appropriate? Does it meet these constitutional limits? Because the police never told law enforcement, the federal agents never told uh, the judge. So here uh, in Washington State, uh, you guys have had a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of reform and change. I don't know if Kate Martin is in the room. There's Kate there. She's a local reporter who really blew the lid on the use of the Stingray surveillance technology by the police in Tacoma. So journalists have been writing about Stingrays since probably 2012. Kate did something special. So it was a really, really insightful move on her part. So it, in local jurisdictions around the country, uh, when questioned by reporters, the police chiefs would say, we always get court orders. And what Kate did was she called up the court and said, so about these court orders that you guys are issuing, what, what, are, the, what do they look like? You know, what do you know about this technology? Um, and so she spoke to Ronald Culpepper, who was the presiding judge in Pierce County, and he said, you know, we've never heard of this. We've never heard of the Stingray. And so you had on one side the police say, we always get court orders, and then the people issuing the court orders saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. And it turned out, yes, they were getting court orders, but the court orders didn't mention what was going on, what they were planning on doing with it, how they collected information about innocent third parties, the fact that when they use this technology, it jams phone calls and people in the neighborhood won't even be able to make incoming or outgoing calls. I mean, nothing was being told to judges. But because of this transparency that's coming from uh, local media, because of organizations like the ACLU that have been forcing this stuff into the sunlight, it's starting to change. And so in Tacoma, we're now seeing that judges uh, have instituted a new protocol. They now demand that the police change the way they get permission for this technology. Judges demand information from the police. And it, all it took was a few front page stories. So, as I said, we've now had hearings in, I think, three states, three or four states about stingrays. There, there are several states where legislation has been introduced. In Virginia, where I live, there's a bill sitting on the governor's desk that would require a warrant for stingrays. I know here in Washington, your state house has passed a bill, and there'll be a hearing tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Uh, for the Senate to, to look at that legislation, and then hopefully it will reach the governor's desk. In Utah, they require a warrant for L all cell tracking. So bit by bit, we're getting some oversight over these invasive cell phone tracking technologies. But what we're not getting just yet is similar oversight and, and action from legislative bodies about hacking technology. I think one of the reasons for that is that right now, we only know that federal agencies are using it. We haven't caught any state or local law enforcement agencies using it. I'm sure they're using it. Right? Hacking team has an office in Maryland. They're sending their salespeople out. They're buying coffee at conferences. I'm sure that someone's bought this stuff. But until we catch them red-handed, until we get a front-page story in a small-town paper, we're not going to get reform. But this technology is so invasive. The idea that the police can turn on your webcam and your microphone without your knowledge and listen to what's happening in your bedroom or in your office or you know, in your psychiatrist's office, this is terrifying, the capability. And there's been absolutely no oversight. And so we need to get oversight over this technology over the use of these tools. We need to make sure that our state legislative bodies and ultimately that Congress takes uh, a close look at this. But it all starts here in small communities and even big cities like Seattle. It all starts with your local ACLU affiliate. It all starts with your local press who are hounding police and getting questions from judges and finding out what your law enforcement agencies are doing. Uh, thank you for your time.
have a question that I would like to ask you, but I want to say a little bit after the question. Um, I like, I really want to salute you for exposing this, what's been going on with this surveillance and all the heroes and that are like Snowden that are going up against the government surveillance and the police surveillance. Um, the, you mentioned Ferguson and many people in this country had their eyes open about the horrific police brutality that's going on in this country. And I go to a lot of meetings here at Town Hall and I always think wouldn't it be so awesome if everybody in this room actually took a tremendous stand with all the people that are being murdered. And how do we do that? How do we get more people that come to ACLU events actually out on the street saying, we're not going to take this shit any longer? Uh, three unarmed man, black men murdered in the last five days, four Latino people, including the man on video that was murdered in Pasco. There's a genocidal aspect to what's happening to black and brown and poor people. And what Ferguson people did is they stood up against the surveillance, they stood up against the military operations, which I know you know all about, what the police is armed to the, you know, they're armed like the military. There's a very close relationship there. So April 14, unabashedly, that's a day to shut down this country and say we're not going to take these murders anymore. And I would like to ask everybody here and you up there on how the people that are very concerned about surveillance can also take a tremendous stand against police brutality. How can we do that? How can we transform things in a month to shut down the country? I don't care. It's too important. People are dying, and everybody knows it. So, I think uh, one important thing to remember about surveillance is that, um, you know, what you were talking about in terms of kind of disproportionate policing of, of communities of color, um, surveillance is a part of that package, right? It means that we're surveilling communities of color more than we are other communities. And so I think, I think it's a really important integral point to this discussion. So I'll have one other point. There, there is a, a fundamental question of equality that, that comes up in surveillance and you know the poor get screwed in so many ways in our society but in the issues that I work on you know if someone walks into a Best Buy and they want to buy a smartphone the brand new $600 iPhone will have encrypted text messaging and encrypted video and encrypted voice and the $100 or $50 Android phone will not have encrypted text messaging and will not have encrypt, encrypted video or voice if you buy a brand new you know, $2,000 or $1,500 MacBook, this encryption is turned on by default. Again, encrypted text messaging and the browser blocks cookies, third-party cookies when you browse the web. You buy a $200 laptop, you know, Black Friday special at Best Buy, you're tracked everywhere you go on the web. Up until recently, this encryption wasn't enabled by default. And so you, we really end up with a situation where the, device, the, elect, the consumer electronic devices that are ending up in the hands of low-income Americans, minorities, uh, the people in rural communities, they're designed to collect your data, not to protect your data. And I think there's something really messed up uh, about the fact that the rich get privacy for free without thinking about it, and the poor are surveilled without knowing about it. Yes. So next question on the left. Okay. Uh, I, I take it from the, the tone of your presentation, you're against all of this. Um, <laughs> but in terms of the topic reining in, I, I mean, what you've shown us tonight is probably just the tip of the iceberg. And so surely us knowing about what app or signal is, is like us trying to um, face down a tank with a BB gun. So, so that's sort of one of my questions. What, what really can we do to prevent this? And, and related to that is, why is it a big deal today? 100 years ago, I mean, I'm against it, but 100 years ago, you know, the telephone operator with a headphone plugging in the cords could listen to every one of our verbal conversations literally. We didn't get upset about that. So what's changed about our society? But my real question is this. So your third question is this. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You, okay. you can choose one in fairness. Okay. Just that was reflection of your presentation. My real question I came for tonight is, I, I have a sense that there's no uproar in our society about this because we're somewhat buying into the message that all this is done to keep us safe. And so unless we can turn the tide of our beliefs that in fact this intrusiveness is a danger to our democracy, and a danger to our society, 
there really won't be more of an uproar about it. So that's, if you only choose one of the questions, address no, that. I, I, Thank I you. Think, I think we can do all three. I don't think that's a problem. Um, <laughs> look, so I'm not going to come here and, and give a talk that, that, scares, that scares you for no reason and leaves you without the feeling like you can do something about it. And I, and I don't want to tell you, here are these token small things that you can do that won't really do anything, but it'll at least make you feel good. I want to give you concrete advice that will actually make a difference. And the issue is surveillance, at, the, at, the, at its core, it comes down to the economics. If the government really, really cares about you, and they think that you're a really bad person or you're a particularly interesting person, they will burn all the resources they have to get you. And there's nothing you can really do to stop that. If they really care about you, they will send people to your house and put microphones under your bed and hack into your camera. They'll do everything. But most of us aren't that important. I suspect that no one in this room is important enough that the government would spend a million dollars to spy on you. So the question is, well, are you interesting enough that they would spend $10 to spy on you? Or $50? Or $100? And so if we can raise the cost of surveillance so that it costs $1,000 or $10,000 or $100,000 for them to spy on you, well, agencies have limited budgets. They don't have the resources to spy on every American when surveillance is expensive. But right now, surveillance is so damn cheap that it's really a question of collect it now and filter it later. And so when you use tools like Signal or WhatsApp or iMessage, and you know, I personally would prefer that you use something like Signal because it's open source. And I think open source is important when it comes to trust and security. But even if you just use the tool that's built into your iPhone, you make surveillance more difficult, you make it more expensive, and suddenly, you know, you might be too expensive for them to spy on because they don't, you know, because you're not going to be, you're not going to be shining in that pile of data. Uh, and then the third question, I forgot what it was because there so were so many So that things. was a question about uproar okay. and why isn't there more uproar? And I think, I think that it's a really valid concern. Um, ultimately, you know, a lot of what you think of when you think about surveillance is fairly abstract. The impact it has on our community is, is, is hard to quantify. And there's certainly things you can point to, impacts on free speech and people's willingness to engage in controversial issues. But, you know, I think the reality is, is that people tend to respond to these things when there are tangible effects that they have. I was talking with Chris earlier about how red light cameras are something that there's a lot of uproar about because there is this tangible impact of, hey, I got this ticket for this thing and there was, you know, no person saw me do it. It just happened to be a, cancer, uh, a camera on a street corner. Um, in the same way, Issues of hacking, I think, for a lot of people are intangible, but then when you have stories about, you know, schools uh, installing spyware on the, on the computers that they give to kids, all of a sudden, you know, there's uproar and, and parents get involved and concerned. So it's, it's really a matter of kind of finding those, those good stories to illustrate these issues and distilling the kind of large abstract concepts into ones that, you know, people can grasp easily. And, it, and it's not easy. Over here. Thank you. Um about a year and a half ago, there was a, a tour about uh, Big Data, the book. And I'd like you to comment on your observations of privatization, of ubiquitous observation, and the algorithms that sort out that information very cost effectively, have nothing to do with the government, but the government uses that data to further their ends. So there's a. Uh a law professor whose work I really like. His name is Paul Ohm. He's at Georgetown Law School. And he talks about this idea of the database of ruin. He says that there's a database somewhere that has information about all of us that if it were revealed to the world, if our loved ones or our colleagues saw that information, it would be disastrous to us. And for all intents and purposes, these databases of ruin have existed for decades. But we had practical obscurity because they were too difficult to collect and to collate and to link to us. What terrifies me isn't that all this data has been collected, because it's been collected for years. What terrifies me is that it's now being linked. And uh, the, the scariest thing that's coming down the pipe isn't big data, it's actually facial recognition. Because the face is the, the identifier that collects all these things. And um, you know, I'm now in a loving relationship. But you know, a couple years ago, I was single, and I had an online dating profile. And you know, every once in a while, maybe someone, a colleague from work, would stumble across my profile. But for the most part, I had my work personality and I had my online dating personality, and they were separate. Uh, 
and we're rapidly moving into a direction where you know, you're browsing the web and you're looking at a dating site and you see someone interesting and you right click on their photo and you say, who is this? And it suddenly tells you their name and their address and where they work and how much they earn and all the research papers they wrote when they were undergrads and all this other stuff. And I don't think our society is wired right now. We don't have, we're not preparing ourselves and protecting ourselves with that kind of technology in mind. And uh, I think many of us are going to be in for a really unpleasant, unpleasant surprise when all this data from disparate databases is linked through the, for, through the unique identifier that you cannot change and cannot run away from, which is your face. All right. I have a Twitter question. So um, uh, what do you expect from social media or cloud companies with regards to avoidance of surveillance? I think this is particularly interesting because of some of the work you've done in terms of poking and prodding certain yeah. companies to you know, bolster their uh, security mechanisms. So I have a love-hate relationship with many of the companies and many of their lawyers. Uh, you know, it's really difficult to get the companies to do things that are not aligned with their business interests. I can pressure companies to roll out encryption. I can pressure companies to update and upgrade their security uh, because ultimately that just, that's just a question of money. But getting them to keep less data ultimately hits their business model. And so getting a company like Facebook to retain less data, getting a company like Google to provide encrypted communications that they themselves cannot access, that's a really tough ask, and I've not been successful in that area. Um, you know, right now, the, the dominant business model, with the exception of a few companies, is you get these services for free, and in exchange you get these great mm -hmm. apps and tools, and you know, the way they make money is by collecting and mining data. And uh, realistically, I don't think that we can expect those companies to change their, their data collection practices and thus their surveillance practices, because if you have it, the government will come and ask for it. Uh, I don't think we can expect that to change until these companies find another way to make money. You know, in Google's case, you know, Google's trying to find a million different ways to make money, whether it's, you know, solar power or self-driving cars or space, uh, uh, what are they, the, the, um, the balloons with Wi-Fi that are flying over continents. Google's clearly like looking for other ways to make money, but as long as Google's lifeblood is advertising, I think we can only expect them to go so far. Again, Google has done probably more than any tech company in the last two years to secure themselves post-Snowden, but that's been to secure the connection between the customer and Google, and the connection between Google and Google, that they haven't locked themselves out of our conversations. And that's really a question of business models more than, um, more than anything else. I think we're at left now. Um, what, uh, if we're going to try to get information from the, if we're going to try to find out what local agencies are getting money, what agencies do we write to in the federal government for FOIA requests to find, those, find out where those grants are going? And, as, and a second question, no lecture, just a question, uh, is um, what is the ACLU doing about smart meters? Because that's a, uh, it's a sign very significant uh, privacy invasion, as well as health and other issues. So on the first question, uh, the main agencies that issue grants are DHS, Department of Homeland Security, and DOJ. Within DHS, it's FEMA that is the uh, grant giving agency, not because FEMA is a surveillance agency, but FEMA is the most equipped agency within DHS to write large checks very quickly. After an emergency, they're really good at giving out money, and so they are the de facto grant giver at, at DHS. Uh, and then you also have the DOD, the military, who provides surplus. Uh, you will find that all of those agencies take a long, long time to respond to FOIA requests. And so I actually encourage you to file your state level equivalent FOIA request with your own local agencies who are the recipient of the grant funds, because they will probably turn those around faster than the feds. Yeah, so for example, the, the Stingray that Tacoma has that, uh, that Chris was referring to earlier in his talk, um, various public records requests to the Tacoma Police Department turned up you know, the, the grant applications um, with FEMA, with, with DHS, and, and often, it, yeah, it's much easier, much quicker. Our, our state level public records laws are much more liberal and permissive than, than, than FOIA, so um, using the Public Records Act where possible is, is, will get you quicker results. And then on, on the smart meter question, because I know there are people in the audience who, who care really deeply about smart meters. Um, you know, traditionally, the, the police could go to the power company and find out some information about your power usage. They could get information on a monthly basis to figure out, you know, whether you were using more electricity than your neighbors. But it was monthly. It wasn't hourly or on the, on, at a minute-by-minute minute level. Uh, 
you know, obviously now that marijuana is legal here, I guess you guys don't have as much of a concern about uh, the police trying to figure out who's using more power than their neighbors. Um, but power data doesn't just reveal whether you have a bunch of grow lamps in, in your house. There's some fantastic research by a professor at the University of Washington here showing that individual appliances in homes have unique fingerprints, electronic fingerprints, that if you have the same, if you have two models of the same television, someone watching the power usage outside the home can actually tell which of those two TVs was turned on. Um, I mean, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, I think that you know, the courts have not done enough to protect power data because, uh, I mean, there are categories of data that get the lowest protection under the law. So banking records and power, sort of traditional things that have been obtained with subpoenas, which law enforcement agencies in many parts of the country can just write themselves. I think that power data can reveal activities inside the home, and I think that what takes place in the home should receive the highest protection un under the law. Um, that's not happening right now. Uh, and so I, I would like to see more protections for that, particularly as computer scientists and electrical engineers reveal just how useful and, and sensitive this data actually is. And, and echoing some of that, I, I think that there's also very serious concerns about the c collaborations between public utilities and private companies in, in sharing this data. I mean, talking about linkability of, of information, nuanced information about what goes inside your home in the hands of Google obviously means something very different than just your utility company having that information. So, you know, state level regulations that prevent utility companies from sharing this, this information for commercial purposes or, or wholesale is obviously something that is, that is critical to preserving some of the balance of privacy here. Okay. Right. What, what, is, what, is, is, what is the ACLU doing now on, with smart meters? Uh, so at the national level, I don't think we're, we're doing much. I think this is a state level issue because it's, uh, the rules are very different in states. I know where there's been the most success has actually been in California where the ACLU uh, and EFF work together to institute data security rules for smart meters. And one of the things we were able to get was mandatory reports published by the power companies every year revealing how many requests they get from law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, people, the police in San Diego submit an order of magnitude more law enforcement requests than any other law enforcement agency in, this, in the state of California. Why, we don't know, but at least we, we now have that data. Um, but that's where we've seen the most success. I don't know, you know what, what's happening here. Great. Thank you. So I have another Twitter question. So uh, perfect content cryptography does little for metadata, um, which is often incredibly sensitive. Do you have any long-term metadata strategies, or do you want to talk about that issue at all? All right, so encryption can protect the contents of your communication. If you use iMessage or FaceTime, uh, the, the authorities, if they haven't hacked your phone, they shouldn't be able to learn what you're saying. But if you call, the, if you call an abortion clinic, someone can probably guess what you're, what you're calling them about. If you uh, call a suicide hotline and you're on the phone for an hour, it doesn't really matter what you say, it's the fact that you're calling that suicide hotline for an hour that's sensitive. And you know, the technical community, the computer security and privacy community, we don't have great tools for protecting metadata with the exception of, of services that hide your information by routing you through other servers. There's a, a great service that I recommend called Tor. Um, that you can use to browse the web uh, anonymously, but Tor is a bit slow. Uh, it's, it's fine for browsing the web, but it's not great for something like a real-time video, video chat or an audio chat. It, the, the latency is too high, and so we don't have a good way of doing low latency, you know, real-time conversations that hide your metadata. Uh, separately, there's no way that we know right now for your cell phone to communicate with a cell tower such that the cell tower won't know where you are. And so over time, we're probably going to move in a direction where we have more and more encryption, which means the police are going to get less and less information about what you're saying, but they're still going to have a huge amount of data about who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, how often you're talking to them, how long the conversation lasted, and where you were when you said that. And that's enough data to hang lots of people. Over here. Uh, I just had a couple of comment, a comment on the, uh, the point about lack of uproar. I'd, I'd point you back to Alt Hux, Huxley said that stuff in the 50s about we're luxuriating ourselves to death. So it's the opposite of a totalitarian state, but same net effect in the end. Um, I had a couple 
questions. One was, could you comment on the, the recent GSM uh, keys theft? And secondly, um, you missed one big kahuna in town that's called Amazon, which just came out with a nice product called Echo, which sits and listens to everything in your house. And so there's only so many kahunas I can tackle in one talk. <laughs> um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, I'll try and summarize the SIM card thing in like a minute. Uh, there's a small chip that's smaller than a postage stamp in most of your cell phones, and that holds an encryption key that only your phone and the cell phone company is supposed to know. And increasingly, modern phones use not amazing encryption, not awful encryption, somewhere sort of in the, in the middle, to protect the, the communications from your phone to the cell tower. But if you know the encryption key, you can, list, you can decrypt the calls. And uh, one of the stories that The Intercept, which is Glenn Greenwald's organization, put out a few weeks ago revealed that GCHQ, which is the British intelligence agency, hacked into the largest manufacturer of these SIM cards and stole hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of SIM cards, of uh, SIM card encryption keys. And so this is hundreds of thousands of keys in Somalia and other countries. But this company, Jamalto, provides SIM cards for AT&T and T-Mobile and Sprint and Verizon, and they also have the $175 million contract for the smart passports that we have in the US, you know, the little antenna thing in your passport that you're not able to bend. Um, and so there are some really interesting and troubling open questions right now about how secure your phone calls are and whether AT&T and T-Mobile and Verizon and Sprint are going to recall the SIM cards and issue new ones or whether they're going to leave us all out in the lurch. Um, that's you know, yet another reason why I don't think we should trust the phone networks to provide us with confidentiality. I think we should use apps that go over the data connection like iMessage and FaceTime and WhatsApp and Signal because I don't trust the phone companies and they have a really bad track record in protecting privacy and security. And, and to follow up with that, I think there's also a very real concern that like money, like, like equipment, um, those you know, compromised SIM cards could trickle down from the NSA to the FBI to local law enforcement to some extent. And so it may not just be the NSA or GCHQ or you know, other kind of foreign intelligence agencies that have access to, to your keys, um, the keys to your communications. It, it could also theoretically be federal and, and local law enforcement. Thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing here, especially exposing the trans or making it transparent what's going on. Um, I'm really concerned about the solutions, though, as I don't think that hiding is enough. It appears that the EU may be well ahead of us with things like the EU data directive. Are US laws really enough, or do we need proactive user rights that give us unalienable rights to view data, to correct data, to have data deleted and removed even from private corporations? and not used against us? I mean, if you're asking me what I would like in an ideal world, I think all of those things are fantastic. Uh, I, I live in Washington, DC, which is one of the least productive cities in the United States. Uh, nothing gets done where I live. Uh, and so you know, if you're waiting for Congress to pass legislation that will give you European-style rights, you're going to be waiting for a while. Uh, that's why, you know, so the ACLU has a lobbying office in Washington, DC, and we have full-time lobbyists who are in Congress every day trying to convince members to pass legislation that would protect your emails, protect your location data to, to rein in the NSA. And they work really hard, and they don't get paid enough money, but realistically, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And what's probably going to happen, you know, so that there's the, the authority that the NSA used to collect everyone's cell phone or uh, call detail records is going to expire this year. And what's probably going to happen is they're going to wait until like midnight the night before it expires and say, oh my goodness, terrorists, we've got to renew this thing. It's an emergency. And then they'll, they'll get what they want. I don't want, them, I don't want that to happen, but that, looking by what's happened in previous years, they do very little until it's absolutely like the last minute, and then they just rush something through. Um, it's for that reason, the reason you know, that, that the people in DC, the political process in DC is so paralyzed that you know, that's why I believe in technology. Technology has the potential to provide basic privacy protections where law and policy lag behind. And you know, it, when a company rolls out default end-to-end -end encryption to 500 million users, it doesn't matter what the rules are. It doesn't matter whether the police need a warrant or a lesser court order or a higher court order. Now those communications are effectively off limits to 
not just the US government, not just the FBI and local law enforcement, the NSA, but to every tin pot authoritarian regime that doesn't respect human rights everywhere in the world. And so technology is just such uh, a major game changer, but we don't decide the technology that we use in many cases. We're reliant on these mega corporations that provide the instant messaging apps and the communications tools and the smartphones. And so, you know, we got to get these folks to play along and we got to pressure them. And there has been some, some state legislation that's moved the needle as well. In California in particular, where so many of these companies are and, and all of them have major presences, um, there have been kind of industry or sector specific laws that have said, hey, you have to use encryption in this context or you have to provide users with the right to delete you know, their profiles in this context. And, and that's actually had a fairly large impact because when California says it or another prominent state says it, um, you find these companies just do it for everyone, right? They roll out features that comply with the law and, and you have that technological impact for you know, all their users. Thank you, so over here. Uh, great lead in to my uh, question. Have you heard of the Surveillance State Repeal Act? It's, um, it was introduced first uh, two years ago by Representative Rush Holt, a Democrat from New Jersey. Um, have you heard of it or not? I haven't, but Rush Holt, was, I think, one of the few physicists in Congress. Uh, he was a very tech-savvy, cool member. I think he retired last year, right? Um, to my knowledge, he's still in Congress. And there's the Surveillance State Repeal Act. It does many different things. Uh, and it requires the GAO to report annually on compliance with FISA. It requires a, a warrant for any surveillance uh, for US persons. Um, but it didn't pass. It has not passed yet. Right now, uh, BORDC, the Bill of Rights Defense Committee, is um, trying to find those um, organizations that would back this bill uh, so that they can push it. I, I don't know if you know Shahid Buttar. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was arrested he, recently for protesting. He was arrested recently yeah. uh, uh, for, um, who was it that he, he was t trying to talk to? Hayden, I think it was? I'm I, I think sure. he tried to do like a citizen's arrest on an ex-NSA official or something, something like that. That's, yeah. that's the kind of thing he would do. It's, exactly. Um, he, he was trying to bring attention to, to the whole issue, obviously. But it, it, nonetheless, um, this bill is still trying to get through. Um, so it is something that they could possibly do. I mean, th there are a number of bills that have been introduced. Yep. The question is like, how do you get, Congress right now is so paralyzed they can barely rename a post office. And, and so for something that's controversial like surveillance, it's just really, really tricky. I mean, there was a bill last year that missed, that would have been passed, but it was two votes short, and that would have done some good. But you know, just getting anything through Congress is really difficult these days. And then the biggest problem as a technologist that I have is that a lot of what the NSA does is outside of the United States, and then isn't governed by the FISA Act or the FISA Amendments Act. It's, the FISA court has no power over it. It's all something called Executive Order 12333. It's just the executive branch deciding what their own rules are. That stuff terrifies me. And, and so you know, I think we need a massive, massive overhaul over the rules that govern the NSA. But I'm not optimistic. I mean, again, you know, I have a... I feel like my job is more uplifting than, than the job of the lobbyists at the ACLU because they fight and fight and fight and then they have to be met with the, the inaction in Congress. Whereas I, can, I have an easier time convincing tech companies to roll out encryption than they have of getting members of Congress to rein in the NSA. I, I wanted to say something real quick. I, I don't, people have, have come up and said, well, you know, what difference does it make? Okay, so we've got spying. We, we've had it for 100 years. So what, what real difference does it make? Uh, but what I don't think people understand is that we've also got on the books right now uh, things like the uh, 2012 NDAA and, and each year after that allows for the indefinite detention of anyone, uh, including U.S. persons, without charge or trial, um, without any justification needed, without any oversight. All of that is allowed uh, today. Um, and there, there's been bills that have been brought forward and they just die because they, they die because you guys are not calling in and demanding that these bills be put into committee and that they get a public hearing and they go to the floor for a vote. They just die. I, I've tried to get the ACLU, the ACLU has spoken at hearings before, but I, I didn't get ACLU uh, participation this year 
to push these bills through. Um, and so it, it'd be nice if ACLU did, it, it'd be great. I, I guarantee you, if everyone in this room today or, or this year had, you know, as one of their objectives to get this, these bills through, then we could at least promise that no state or local resources would be used for the indefinite detention of someone. And we could do our best to make it a crime so that if someone were abducted under the NDAA, it would be as any other abduction. All right. Thank, Thank you for you. your comment. I think we should take one from over here. Yeah, getting back to that so-called smart meter, um, I, I wanted to see if I could pass some of these brochures out. This is a bit of a more immediate and local concern. Um, our, one of our utility companies, Seattle City Light, is planning to replace all of the analog meters on everybody's buildings in Seattle over the next couple, three years with these things called smart meters or advanced or um, alternative meters. And uh, other than privacy concerns, it's also safety concern. It's been known to burn up homes. Um, it's also been known to um, pulsate electromagnetic frequencies 24-7. Uh, and the cost is also not going to make a difference. In fact, a lot of people have had bigger bills. And so I'm wondering if I could just be in the back later on to pass out whatever brochures I have. Um, you, you can certainly give out flyers in the back of the So brochure. I, I actually think Town Hall has a rule against oh. passing off literature okay. inside here, but you can in the lobby yeah, or, or the lobby. outside the doors. Okay. Um, Would you fun. like a couple to start here? So. I actually got one on my way in. So oh, you're I, on the way I, in. I got okay. two on the way in, actually, so I'm, I'm good. Uh, over here. Um, thanks for all the work you're doing. Uh, I just wanted to ask again if you can talk a little bit more about Amazon. Um, I've read uh, multiple times about a, a multi-billion dollar agreement that they have with the CIA um, that involves cloud computing. Um, you know, Amazon is here locally, and so uh, I think they would be maybe somewhat responsive if uh, members of the local community uh, sort of targeted them for a protest or whatever. Sure. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. And, and then just secondly, um, can you address the, the argument with, that you mentioned that the FBI and others make that they are only going after bad guys and that all of this technology, all of this surveillance is targeted specifically to bad people and therefore it doesn't affect everyone else? Um, when I talked to an uh, FBI spokesperson about the, um, the impersonating an AP reporter, uh, her response was incredibly flippant, and it was basically, well, we could impersonate anyone if uh, we were trying to get a bad guy. Uh, this, per this kid was calling in bomb threats. You know, we, we could have just impersonated a dentist um, in order to get him to install this spyware on his computer. So how, how do you respond to that, that mindset on the part of all these agencies? So those are excellent questions. Um, so I, I regularly communicate with the lawyers at all the big tech companies and uh, I've hit a wall with Amazon. It's just really difficult to reach the right people there. <clears throat> In the last you know, couple of years, particularly post-Snowden, companies that were never transparent, like Apple, have been much more transparent. They publish reports now every twice a year revealing how many surveillance requests they get. Yahoo, Facebook, Microsoft, all are publishing transparency reports. Zero from Amazon. And you know, it's not just requests for user data, it's requests for data stored by Amazon's cloud computing clients, right? Why would you go to some dinky startup when you can go to Amazon and get data about the services that are being provided through their cloud computing services? And so, um, you know, I think Amazon has really escaped uh, the spotlight. I think, you know, maybe we dropped the ball on that. Maybe we should have been focusing more of our attention uh, on them. I think it's about time that Amazon published a transparency report. I think that they, they should do that. We'd love to see them uh, follow the lead of other companies and adopt progressive policies like notifying users about surveillance requests unless they're prohibited from doing so via gag order. That's something that every company could do, but very few actually do. Um, yeah, I mean, Amazon has a massive reach. And then you know, they, they, have been provi they provide cloud computing services to many federal agencies, including uh, the CIA, that doesn't really terrify me. I mean, the, you know, Dell sells laptops and computers to government agencies. That doesn't make them a surveillance company, but um, I definitely think Amazon could be more upfront about the kinds of surveillance requests they receive. You know, for the second question about what well, we're just spying on bad guys, I think it's important to differentiate between domestic law enforcement and foreign intelligence. In the domestic law enforcement front, there are several technologies like the Stingray that although they say they're only using them to catch bad guys, 
the technologies are overbroad by their very nature. You cannot turn on a Stingray and identify one phone. You turn it on and you get the cell phone serial numbers of everyone in the room. And their response is, well, yeah, we don't really save that information. We might collect it, we might send signals into your living room, into your car, into your purse, but don't worry, we're not looking at it after. And you know, my response to that is, well, you know, if they put a, a video camera in your bedroom and said, well, don't worry, it's not turned on, or we'll only turn it on if you're a bad guy, I don't think many of us would be comfortable with that. Uh, that's not an excuse. On the foreign intelligence surveillance side, it's actually worse because you know, I think post-Snowden, the response from the government has been, well, look, there are these really bad people out there. You know, we need to spy on them, terrorists, you know, that kind of thing. But what the Snowden documents have shown is, in fact, a lot of the surveillance that the US government does and its partners like the British and the Canadians do isn't aimed at terrorists. It's aimed at people who are interesting. And interesting is way broader. That can be, you know, we want to spy on uh, you know, the opposing negotiators in some trade treaty. We want to listen to the telephone calls of foreign leaders. We want to hack into the computers of engineers at Belgacom, not because we believe this Belgian phone company is a terrorist outfit, but because they provide telephone service to people who are interesting. And so the logic of the NSA and GCHQ now basically means that any engineer, any computer, any system administrator or someone who does technology at any global infrastructure company, anyone that makes any technology that interesting people might use is fair game. And I think that's really messed up. And I mean, I used to be a sysadmin, so this is like a personal thing, but I don't think it's cool. I don't think, I don't think we signed up. I certainly never saw the debate where the NSA said, oh yeah, by the way, we're gonna stalk engineers online. We're gonna follow their every communication online and then deliver malware targeting them because we want to get into their employers. I didn't sign up for that, and I didn't agree to that, and Congress certainly never passed legislation approving that, and I think those kinds of activities undermine the very legitimacy of what the NSA is doing. It's one thing to spy on bad guys, but every engineer in the world shouldn't be fair game. All right, we have time for one last question. Okay, uh, as far as smart meters, I believe that Port Angeles, Washington has restricted their use, so maybe we should start on the local level. My question is about using Linux operating system. I can dual boot my used laptop into Windows or Linux. From a privacy standpoint, how much does that help? Uh, I've been using Linux since I was uh, 12 years old. I, I like Linux. Uh, I use it on my computer. Um, we, use, we are a Linux-friendly employer at the ACLU. Uh, I think that you know, having choice is always a good thing. And, Given the revelations that we've seen in the last year, particularly in the last year, uh, I'm starting to have less and less trust in closed source software and what the Linux community is doing, particularly the Debian, which is a, a group within Linux, they're working on something called reproducible builds, which is a way of knowing that the, the code that you're download or the binary that you're downloading came from the source code that developers put online. And uh, I want more trust in the software that I use and I think open source software like Linux provides you with that trust. It's not a guarantee, but it's definitely better than trusting something that came from some, some outfit that, I've, that I have no way of, of inspecting. And that's it, right? Could I have, yeah. one, could I have one thing that you I'm, mentioned? I'm, we, sorry, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, so I just wanted to say thanks to Chris for, for flying out here from DC and spending this time with us, and thanks to everyone in the room for, for coming and visiting. Have a good night.